Welcome back to the Industry 4.0 and Sustainable Supply Chain stage at COGEX. I really hope that you enjoyed the last session as much as I did. I am Katz Keeley. I'm the CEO of Beep and the founder of Frontline Live, and I'm going to be your MC for the next couple of days. This next session is called Industry 4.0. What is the impact on sustainability? So any second now, I'm going to hand you over to Alessandra Solberger, who is the founder of Top Tier Impact. She's going to talk about where things are at with manufacturing through the lens of sustainability. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? Over to you, Alessandra. Thank you so much, Katz. And hi, everyone. I'm excited to present a panel full of people at the front lines of uh, what's happening in sustainability and in manufacturing. As many of you know, being on this broadcast, uh, a lot is happening, a lot is underway. So we're going to be exploring the challenges, the opportunities, and some other kind of insights from, as I said, the front lines of this. So I'll start with uh, some introduction and I'll start with myself. I'm Alessandra. I'm uh, the founder of a global network of impact investors, impact entrepreneurs and corporate leaders, top tier impact. We are across 30 countries. Uh, we have over 250 members who are really representing all the areas of impact and sustainability. And so kind of what's happening uh, across their sectors is what we deal with every day and what we see all the time. It's kind of like a pulse that we keep on the state of this global industry. And I think that today, zooming into what's happening with supply chains, with manufacturing is going to be extremely exciting. I've been seeing a lot in there. So without further ado, we will start with uh, Luc Gerard then. Luc, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Yes, hello, my name is Luc Girardin. I am a client solution executive at Cognizant. So I basically help uh, our customers build uh, innovative solutions, uh, primarily focusing on artificial intelligence and analytics, but also connecting them with areas like cloud um, or IoT. Uh, and I am also a member of Top Team. Thank you so much, Luc. Martina, over to you. Hi, my name is Martina McPherson. I'm a senior vice president for ESG engagements at Moody's Corporation, and I'm also a uh, or the president of the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets, an industry and academic think tank for discussing sustainability issues for the next generation. Thank you, Martina. Wolfgang, over to you. Yeah, my name is Wolfgang Demacher. I'm a non-executive board. Uh, member, executive advisor, business angel. I partner with corporates, startups, and asset owners to drive uh, collectively uh, digital transformation. I'm a member of uh, several think tanks for the German government uh, for SG Innovate in Singapore, uh, because my passion is uh, innovation in supply chains. Thank you, Wolfgang. Daniel, please introduce yourself. Daniel. So we will move over to Jason. Hi, uh, it's uh, it's Jason Mitchell. Thanks, Alessandra, for the opportunity to be on this. Um, so I'm Jason Mitchell. I'm co-head of Responsible Investment at Man Group. I oversee our uh, approach, strategy, and integration when it comes to uh, uh, ESG and impact across the firm. And I also host uh, I also host a podcast called A Sustainable Future. Fantastic. We're all about the sustainable future here. <laughs> Daniel, maybe we can bring you on as well. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, great. Um, so my name's Dan Watson. I'm head of sustainability for Amber Infrastructure. So we invest in, in infrastructure of the future. And uh, my role is to, to make sure we're doing doing that in the right right areas. Alongside that role, I'm also board director for the Institute for Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability and delighted to be here with, with you all. Fantastic. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everybody else. So let's kick things off. First question, just to start diving into the field, is what is the current stand of Industry 4.0, as we call it, and its maturity and adoption level? Wolfgang, would you like to start? With pleasure, Alexandra. Uh, the, the first thing I would like to uh, 
to say about that is uh, that uh, industry 4.0, 4.0 is not a very well defined term. So it can be a lot of things for, for different people. I always take a very broad approach and uh, say it's technology which helps uh, to uh, improve and at the end automate uh, industrial processes. And, and that's where it comes to supply chains. And uh, we all know now uh, during COVID-19 what supply chains are and, and why, why they are so important. They are very operational, but when you look at it from a 4.0 point of view, then uh, they become overlaid with more technology, with intelligence. And uh, that means that we are using intelligent assets. We are using trucks and vessels and planes that have a lot of technology and that can connect with other parts along the chain. And by the way, I don't believe that it's a chain. Uh, it is a network, it is a system. Because just imagine that in one factory, products are made from a lot of different parts and they are coming, coming from very different places and that not in a linear process. So I always talk about uh, a supply network, in fact, uh, which is the ecosystem of four point of industry four point uh, oh. and uh, it is also not only about supply and e-commerce because that changed the direction of the flow from a product push to a customer pull. So. That means when we talk about industry 4.0, we are talking about a connected world, a connected industry, a connected economy. And I think that's important when we talk about sustainability because that can create these butterfly effects that at one part of the network, something happens which then ripples across the entire system. So I, I think that's important to frame our, our discussion. So where do we stand in terms of um, adoption, maturity? When, when approaching that question, we also have to be aware that we have a lot of old assets around, old assets which are still working very well, they're fit for purpose, but they are not intelligent, they are not connected and are also difficult to retrofit, but there are always ways to work around this. So a lot of discussion about Industry 4.0 is about new means, new processes, new technology, but we have to be mindful about that it's also about um, old machines and how to retrofit and how to integrate that. And that makes it so hard. So when I was uh, at the World Economic Forum, uh, working on the next generation production. We looked into the maturity of uh, Industry 4.0 and we benchmarked uh, Latin America and the Caribbean against uh, developed economy, uh, economies like uh, Japan, like Singapore, uh, South Korea, France, Italy, Germany, the UK, the US. And uh, we did that also to understand what, what drives uh, 4.0, what drives industry 4.0. And uh, there are in fact three, three factors which uh, can help to drive it. And, and that is how much, the first one is how much are supply chains vertically integrated? So, so when you have countries which have uh, a lot of steps and cover a lot of steps are very diversified, they have a higher chance to implement 4.0. Then another one is the um, competitiveness. The more competitive an industry is, the more uh, you have the chance to, uh, to drive 4.0. And so, just then, there are, there, are, there are more factors. What, what also is important in 4.0 is to understand the role of the government. Because when we talk about connectedness and connected systems, 
they need digital infrastructure, they need communication networks. So if you if the government doesn't uh, drive the development to connect not only the devices, but the companies, the, the supply networks, then it's very hard to do. So I'm saying that because um, some people are quickly to say, okay, this country is, or this uh, company is not very digital, but you have to see the entire context. And um, what, what governments can do is to align the policies the policy framework, the regulatory framework. And if you look into the world, there are very different approaches to it. And the most integrated frameworks are available in Singapore and China uh, with their more top-down approach. And another important thing is the size of a company. So small and mid-sized companies have more difficulties than large ships. And the, <clears throat> the large companies can help the entire ecosystem to um, to grow, and then I come to the third factor, which I didn't mention before, which is in fact how global is an economy, and the more global it is, the more knowledge it can import, the, and the more practices, whether it's digital or sustainable, and all that I hope explains uh, a bit uh, why I cannot say that is the stage of maturity and that is the stage of adoption. Uh, it, requires, it requires really to go into detail because it is a systemic question. Fantastic. Wolfgang, thank you so much for setting the stage. Uh, Look, is there anything else that you'd like to add on this? Yeah, I think there are factors that also add up to that, uh, which are the human organi organizational factors. Uh, there, there is also a lot of difference between the industries. You know, if you look at aerospace, they're not going to be at the same stage as, uh, for instance, construction. Uh, <clears throat> but I would say many of these industries have a, 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 an heritage from the second industrial revolution. And now they have to switch to the, the fourth industrial revolution. So it might be a, a long step. On, along the way of this transformation, there are a couple of factors that uh, prevent them to do that smoothly. Um, some of them are around their, their operating model and their organizational models, you know, which are built for robustness, for scale, uh, on typically uh, models that are very hard to, uh, to change. You, know, you, are, you put a bit of rigidity in these models, uh, and that's why uh, it's uh, difficult to change. They are super tankers, not speedboats, many of these companies. Um, uh, also, I think the, the personality type that you can find in this type of industry, so people with engineering backgrounds, are again very good for uh, incremental innovation. They are good for, for efficiency, operational excellence, uh, but it might be more difficult for them to look at, um, let's say, disruptive transformation of disruptive innovation. As, as an anecdote, for instance, uh, I'm, I'm trying to go sailing with a friend of mine who is an engineer. And the crew is getting a bit too big, so the, the, the boat is getting a bit too small. And I told him, why don't you take a, a bigger boat? And he told me, no, we as engineers, we like to you know, uh, optimize within our boundaries. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah. and he told me, you know, you come silent, you can think out of the box, and you, know, you have a constraint to remove it, and you do something else. But you know, they, they need a frame somehow. They need a boundary to, uh, to uh, run and optimize their business. They need this structure. And it, it's, of course, very important for the company, the way they operate now, uh, in terms of, um, you know, being able to operate uh, effectively at scale. But if you want to change that, it takes a lot of time. Yes, it's great you mentioned this, Luke, because we all need to try and understand each other's perspectives. And uh, when you're dealing with complex problems, there are a lot of different stakeholders involved. And so trying to make sure that we can put ourselves in each other's shoes um, is important here. We're gonna get to something that is uh, a heated debate in the space because we currently don't quite have harmonization on impact metrics. At Top Tier Impact, we recently ran a global report on impact metrics for our members. We also polled all our investors across the globe about what metrics they use, what the pros and cons of those are, and then we shared it among us. And uh, unsurprisingly, there are a lot of different approaches in here. And so Martina, from your perspective, could you please give us an overview of uh, what current measurement systems there are in sustainability today? 
Sure, with great pleasure. I mean, I'm looking at it same as you, Alessandra, from an investment and an investor lens. So ultimately, they are the two major areas or pillars, one around normative drivers and the other one around regulatory frameworks. Um, if we are looking at the normative drivers, there are a multitude of um, frameworks out there linked to assessing in the supply chain oversight and broader S context, human rights and labor rights implications. We look at ILO core standards, ISO principles and classifications, UN Global Compact and UNGP and the traditional reporting frameworks as put out there by the Global Reporting Initiative and the IRRC. Increasingly, we see also the link back to sustainability accounting, and that's been made on material issues, financial issues by SASB. On the other side, the regulatory drivers here from a European context are up and foremost led by the initiatives of the European Commission. Um, and it has come up most recently with the launch of the Sustainable Finance Action Plan, which includes a green taxonomy, it includes a green bond standard, it includes disclosure for climate aligned benchmarks and also for disclosure more broadly of non-financial, I would classify this extra financial information, which is the traditional ESG slash sustainability information disclosed by companies. And the current consultation for um, the latest EU NFRD, the non-financial reporting directive is currently out in the market. Um, the plans are to actually get a better picture on what information is disclosed of non-financial information and diversity as it was historically utilized in the context of the regulatory framework, the EU Directive 2014-95. Um, it's interesting there are inherent biases in these regulations given that uh, the 2014-95 Directive applies to companies listed and with more than 500 employees. So there's a huge um, opportunity, but also a huge challenge to look at the wider sphere when we especially also assess medium sized to small sized companies in the wider supply chains of these organizations. Um, a couple of key takeaways, ultimately, why there are currently these challenges with non-financial information and the inherent biases around reporting. Up and foremost, based on recent studies, companies are reporting at large in, in a very insufficient and ineffective manner when it comes to specific extra financial factors or criteria, given that there are no, no common denominators or standards per se. There is a lack of clarification definitions around standards where non-financial performance is, um, is ultimately applied. And uh, there is generally a, a perception around the market failure in corporate disclosure more broadly on sustainability risks and their impacts. And uh, Alessandra, you highlighted on, on a side note here as well, the different impact classification frameworks. I participated in a study by the UK government-backed initiative for a social impact investing, better, report, better reporting under the leadership of Paul Druckmann, the former CEO of the IRC. And we looked at 16 different impact classification frameworks and tried to define the common denominators across these ESG and SDG slash impact frameworks and to better understand one how these side of criteria could provide a perspective on when and how impact could be assessed. It's becoming clear that it is up and foremost again challenging to define the right definitions. It is a challenge to look at implications not only from a sector perspective as it's done in the context of materiality assessments but also in a broader uh, regional context and that of course plays a huge huge importance when we look at impact assessments and the regional context not only looking at developed versus emerging markets but also in a country by country context um, and ultimately what has become clear out of the most recent discussions around these topics is that there is uh, and there's a need for a more dynamic relationship between materiality and the definitions around materiality, for instance, in the context of double materiality, the external externalities of an organization in the context of its activities and how this contributes positively or negatively towards environmental or societal challenges and the role and the impact the organization has on the wider stakeholder value chain. And there's also ultimately a link back to mandatory reporting standards 
um, they are necessary from a public perspective to gather further information and more clarity and consistency around information as we had highlighted, but also in, in the context of the company's own considerations and the understanding of what it defines and how it defines materiality. So ultimately, um, disclosure on governance and management of organizations, very often the starting point for many ESG assessments in the past remains key, but also understanding the wider environmental and social impacts of an organization are becoming a prerequisite. Absolutely, great points, Martina, in there. Um, regulation is uh, coming on so many fronts, like the EU legislation coming in, regional differences also need to be accounted more for um, because they're substantial. Maybe then, as an infrastructure-focused investor, uh, what would you like to add on this? Well, uh, firstly, I'd uh, you know echo all of Martina's points. I think they were, they were excellent. I think from, from our perspective, even within infrastructure, the amount of different standards and guidance and benchmarks and everything is, is quite overwhelming, even for, for you know, uh, someone who spends a lot of lot of time in it, and uh, and I think part of the challenge is really trying to understand you know which one of these are, are really valuable to investors and which ones are going to sort of turn the dial. You know, personally, we've been looking at uh, a number of different ones specific for for infrastructure in terms of you know SASB, GRESB uh, infrastructure. But then there's also CDP, GRI. There's all the acronyms, and it gets very difficult to work out. Uh, which one investors value. So when we talk to our investors, quite often they haven't heard of some of these um, these standards. Now, what we are hearing a lot of is uh, investors are very interested to know what the contribution towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And what I like about those is that they are, you know, they provide a, a sort of a global framework uh, for action. But there's actually very little that sits beneath it that is directly relevant to, to, to sectors. And so it's very hard to, to develop uh, anything that um, potentially is, is valuable that uh, investors can compare apples for apples, really. So I, I, I think what I would really like to see over time is sort of the convergence of these. And, and you're starting to see that, you know, in terms of GRESB um, infrastructure referencing uh, task force for climate related financial disclosures which is which is great and then you know you get various points for for, for, for other um, standards and, and climate marks as well but it really is quite messy and quite difficult for non-technical uh, non-technical audience to to understand but what I do like is the um, is how um, organizations are voluntarily pursuing these and i'm a big fan of sort of self-regulation because i think industry is the best place to regulate as opposed to being top down but i do think regulation has a, a hugely important role to play in providing uh guidance and a steer so again uh task force for climate related financial disclosures is is a really good one you know they've got over a thousand signatories at the moment it's voluntary but you know, in the UK, it's looking that it's going to be um, mandatory in due course. So I, I think a blend, but I think everything's moving so fast, it's going to be very difficult for regulation to keep up with, with, with pace. So uh, long story short, I think it's just quite complicated. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, Dan, thank you for that. I think we can all agree. And so let's see how it evolves. But before we move into a different topic, Martina, is there anything else that you would like to add on uh, regulatory frameworks out there and the way that you're seeing them evolving? Well, one thing maybe to add is that we are seeing global drivers when it comes to up and coming um, regulatory drivers. And ultimately also the, the coexistence of many frameworks as well as the alignment of frameworks I would fully agree with the, the previous speakers, the, the sheer number and quantity of these existing normative frameworks is currently overwhelming. But we have seen great initiatives, for instance, by CDSB on better alignment of these sort of um, reporting frameworks and standards, an initiative and a report that came out last year that actually made the effort to align and look for the common denominators between CDP, C TCFD, UN Global Compact, ISO and other type of normative standards. 
And as I said and highlighted, now we're seeing in Asia an increasing focus on, for instance, alignment around green bond standards between what we had historically as um, the People's Bank of China's and NDRC's um, different type of frameworks that are sitting and coexisting side by side with the climate bonds initiatives, green bond frameworks for labeled green bonds. And hence, these type of alignment addition initiatives are now becoming a global phenomena where ultimately there is a lack of global regulation for similar standards or end or frameworks. Alessandra, I'd uh, add some stuff to this. Can you get, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I guess I'd say that uh, it's, it's very easy to get disheartened by the fact that there is a just a tremendous amount of innovation of frameworks of, of standards sort of coming out over the last particularly the last five to 10 years. Um, you know, and, and even within that, it, it, I tend to think of it or conceptualize it as, you know, think of regulation, think of uh, of standards and think of frameworks, and they're all moving at their own cadence, um, and they're all sort of very specific regionally. I, you know, that stack uh, will look very specific in Europe relative to the U.S. Obviously, um, one thing I would say is at least going through the pandemic right now to sort of make this more topical. It's interesting. It's actually fascinating to see sort of the reaction function from from certain governments on 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 how to treat this. So, for instance, in the U.S. Um, you know, the reaction function is let's undo more regulation. So let's 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 uh, deregulate more to help businesses grow through the pandemic crisis. And I give a tremendous amount of credit, as Martina said, to the European Commission, um, who has, despite there being some obviously obvious delays because of the pandemic, um, their ambitions remain as committed um, as as they first announced over one to two years ago uh, with the EU draft re regulation. One thing I would I would note though, um, so I, I'm involved in something called FRAG. It's the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, and this is a European Commission uh, uh, steering lab that uh, makes recommendations to the Commission around non-financial and 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 financial reporting standards, um, and it's. You know, as you've had over the last two years, this the, a huge, tremendous effort, as Martina said, around uh, uh, indexes, green bonds, and the taxonomy. I, I think you've had relatively late in the process this uh, uh, this realization by the European Commission, specifically within DG FISMA, but even more broadly that that um, there is an opportunity to drive down, almost as, as, as Wolfgang framed it earlier, to sort of drive down this top-down uh, um, standard um, in this process. And so what we're doing within FRAG, um, earlier this year, Vice President Dobrovsky um, had mentioned uh, that uh, there will, the EU will make, an, the European Commission will make an effort to create an, an ESG standard. Now, they are, um, they're pretty savvy. They're not naive enough to think that this won't be difficult or fraught with a lot of uh, of, of embedded interests, etc. Uh, but what they recognize is that, you know, as you uh, uh, make things more uh, regulatorily and even statutorily uh, um, rigorous, you have a a, a unique opportunity <coughs> to um, converge standards. Um, and so what we're doing right now is going through a mapping exercise, gap analysis to um, using a whole bunch of standards and measure, measurement systems out there, SASB, GRI, you name it. Um, and the idea is that Europe has this opportunity to sort of um, kind of cohere around this. Um, they're not naive enough to think that that that, that clearly uh, the U.S. will be part of this, but you know there are some precedents. For uh, for instance, GDPR was a uh, was an EU initiative, and that has actually been widely adopted by many companies that simply don't want the hassle of of managing two um, um, two standards around around privacy. Um, so so I do think that there is a a big opportunity going forward in terms of what the EU is doing. Um, there, there are some teething issues. Again, it's sort of interesting to hear uh, Wolfgang discuss this. One of the teething issues is uh, uh, SMEs. So, you know, NFRD, obviously it, it sort of really focuses on listed companies with more than 500 employees. How do you actually bring smaller SMEs, you know, SMEs into the fold um, without making it 
uh, a, a, an exercise solely around uh, resources, you know, or, or well-resourced compliance and legal department. Because the historical problem with that that resourcing element is that you get transparency bias. You get large companies um, throwing a lot of resources at that at that, and because of the resources they do, they tend to score very well by rating agencies, uh, MSCI, Sustainalytics, you name it. And it really sort of starts to throw, from an investor perspective, a lot of bias in terms of what you're trying to measure. Fantastic. Thank you, Jason, for adding these points. And uh, we all want to see some pragmatism as well in these processes. And so that's always good news. To dive a little bit more into the investment landscape, still to you, Jason, like, or how are investors like changing their approach in manufacturing and in supply chain investments to include sustainability as well? What are you seeing there? So, I mean, I, I still think it's it's very um, dependent on the industry, and it's still very early. For instance, um, so so we're we're still kind of coming up the curve in terms of risks, different times of t different types of risks. Um, there's some great data sets that are now coming out around physical risk and and how you can sort of measure the physical risk across your your uh, supply chain. Um, the more complicated, uh, you know, the TCFD is the transition risk and, and the implications for that. Uh, another risk that we often have to deal with is is reputational risk, um, and, and you'd be surprised at, at how problematic this this idea is and the kind of data sets that we have to work with. I will just give you one example um, because this was a very real one that happened mid last year. There was a mid cap uh, German chemicals company, very well regarded. Um, it sold chemicals into a Syrian chemical company. Now that Syrian chemical company sold that onto a, another company that produced sarin gas. And so at, there was some sort of expose within the news and suddenly the supply chain was sort of laid bare and the implication being that this German chemical producer um, and, and distributor was sort of at the crosshairs of this. And the implications were significant. So for instance, I mean, we're a fairly large asset manager. We have a 0% tolerance when it comes to controversial arms and munitions, including uh, 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 gas. We would have had to sell immediately. And, and, and that's true for many other investors. And so I guess my point is we're always trying to sort of understand the risks across supply chains, which are very difficult. Um, one, one area, you know, when you think about frameworks and, and what area specifically that needs a lot more work is frameworks that can be used for investors. Um, TCFD, I think, was incredibly impactful because it, in the most unequivocal way, sort of helped converge investors around weighted average carbon intensity or sort of brought the idea of, of scenario analysis, um, um, despite you know some of the issues around where you get this data. But, but it, it sort of brought this to the fore and, and created a, a, a huge talking point. Um, in many other areas, we're sort of lacking the kind of granular, rigorous framework at, from, from an investor perspective to kind of put into place um, outside of just the E, you know, kind of uh, uh, scope one, scope two, scope three, obviously, uh, a carbon accounting element. It, it, it's 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 uh, that area, I think, needs a lot more maturation in terms of, of, of building out that framework. I, I'm going to pause right there because I know that Daniel had wanted to uh, add some as well. Yes, absolutely. Dan or Martina, uh, what would you like to say about the changing investment landscape that you see? Yeah, great. Well, <clears throat> I think from you know from our perspective, we're we're a bit different, I, I suppose, because we directly invest in, in in real assets, which gives us a really great uh, insight in many respects. Now, you know, taking the, the the COVID situation, I think it's quite interesting because you know one of the upsides has been the significant reduction in in emissions. So the International Energy Agency estimated around eight percent. The downside of that is, you know, we need to do that every year for the next 10 years if we're going to meet the Paris Agreement objectives. And we're not even talking about sort of net zero uh, targets here. Um, so lockdown's not going to continue. Factories are going to reopen. So if we're going to have any chance of sort of meeting those targets, there has to be some pretty radical systematic change. And it could be some good behavioral changes that will reduce emissions. So, you know, in terms of working from home, um, we'll have a big 
impact on, uh, on emissions from transport. But fundamentally, our energy, transport, and digital systems aren't uh, aren't fit for for purpose. So, you know, as infrastructure investors, we're interested in the, the building blocks of society, and it's important that we get these right. And as Wolfgang mentioned, if if the underlying infrastructure isn't right, the benefits from Industry 4.0 uh, will be limited. You know, from an amber perspective, how are we changing our approach with sustainability? I guess in many ways we're not. Amber's always sought to make sustainable investments that uh, uh, provide predictable long-term returns. However, we're definitely seeing stronger appetite from sustainable investment from investors. Um, and with the changes needed to transform infrastructure uh, to enable uh, a cleaner society, reduce emissions, cater for changing demographics, the opportunity is greater than ever before. So from our perspective, I suppose there's, there's two ways we look at it. So first off, we can invest in infrastructure that is fundamentally required to drive more sustainable systems. So for example, if we're going to benefit uh, from Industry 4.0, it needs to be built on rock solid digital infrastructure. And by that, I mean all the nuts and bolts that you don't see uh, that sit beneath your computer or phone. So decent fiber optic broadband, clean data centers. At the moment in the UK, we're lagging behind other OECD nations with less than 10% of the population having access to, to fast broadband. So, you know, we're working with the UK government uh, on the National Digital Infrastructure Fund which is looking to roll out fibre across the UK to help make the UK more productive and uh, reduce the digital divide. Secondly, uh, at Amber, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to find out how we can manage our assets it, it better in a more sustainable way. So we have a very large asset management team that directly engages with investments on a, on a daily basis. We definitely see a, an increasing role for technology to help us do this. Um, we manage a large number of social infrastructure investments, uh, for example, and you know the role of technology to manage the the energy of those we, we definitely see. But also, you know, we develop these uh, assets from scratch. So, you know, the uh, digitally enabled modern methods of construction is, is very exciting for us. So we're engaged with Innovate UK to explore that further. Um, I, I guess we try to approach both. Uh, the, the investment, looking at good investments uh, from that uh, are sustainable are going to support um, Industry 4.0, sort of manage uh, our assets in a very progressive way. So we've got a, a program, uh, Amber Horizons, which we look to um, integrate emerging uh, and future trends into business decision making. So I suppose, you know, this is really important that we get it right, not just because it's the right thing to do, but um, over the, the, the long term, we feel if we can make investments and manage them in a, in a progressive way, they're going to uh, stand the test of time and you know provide better returns over the, the long run, really. Uh, Alessandra, do you mind if I just add one more thing? Um, yeah, it's, it, you know... It's so important so that we can stay on track with time. Oh, sure. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I'm just... Go for it. Go for it. Okay, no, I was just gonna say that w one thing I think that you're gonna see uh, much more in terms of investors appear over the next 12 months is is our, our sort of engagements and stewardship. I mean, you, you've, we've come into this year and seen some very profound precedents, um, Barclays Resolution 30 um, and in response Resolution 29, this is this climate shareholder proposal put forth by Share Action. Um, it was sort of the first in the UK, um, w which really, uh, uh, in some ways was successful. You saw other precedents happen in Japan uh, for the first time ever. I think over the next 12 months, you're going to see that maybe move more on the S side, particularly having gone through the, the pandemic. And there's going to be a lot of sort of soul searching in terms of what the underemployment or employment issues around uh, 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 you know, so the S issue, the ILO issues, sort of zero contract, uh, zero hours contract or, or collective bargaining issues are going to sort of come to the fore in terms of supply management. Um, and I, I, I suspect, you know, in the next 12 months, in the next AGM season, there are going to be a, a number of shareholder proposals um, that look at supply chain and the social element. Thanks, Jason. Very topical as well to bring this up, uh, given what's happening in the world. So we're going to move to a different topic. Um, Luke, for you and uh, your expertise in the space, what technologies are enabling Industry 4.0 and how are they shaping the new manufacturing and supply chain landscape? 
Yeah, I think, you know, when you <coughs> learned about supply chain uh, 20 or 15 years ago, uh, you know, you were taught that there are basically three flow. One flow is the flow, the physical flow, the flow of goods. One flow is the flow of information. And then there is a financial flow. And obviously, the physical flow was really at the center. And we're sort of moving out slowly of this paradigm where the information flow is getting more and more at the center for different reasons. One reason is to optimize actually the, the, the physical flow, so the flow of goods. The other reason is that um, uh, a lot of business models from this kind of, of types of company are getting more and more data driven, um, which means that uh, some companies now are selling data or are selling services relying on data on top uh, of their uh, of their goods. So if you look at aircraft manufacturers, for instance, uh, like Airbus or Boeing, you know, they build planes, but when they sell a plane, they also sell, sell maintenance services, which is based on thousands of data that they collect from their planes, so their whole fleet. So let's say they, they build the A350, and they will collect actually a lot of information from all these planes and be able to advise actually the airlines on how to maintain their planes optimally and therefore help them save money. But that comes also for, uh, for a fee. So um, <clears throat> that's why uh, uh, these technologies are now uh, ramping up pretty quickly on, along with this transformation. And there are three core elements. Uh, one is around the data generation. Second one is around data management. And the third one is around data analytics. So basically managing the whole uh, data flow. Uh, so data generation in the context of, of, of uh, Industry 4.0 is primarily uh, technologies on uh, Internet of Things. Um, this is the core of, of uh, Industry 4.0 is to connect operating technology with information technology, which was typically separate systems. So you had systems running the machines and then systems running the company. And this is connecting them. So you build uh, data sets that come from your, your, your industrial assets. Uh, so this is the first technology and this is moving relatively fast it was done for for many years uh putting sensors using uh, communication devices but now they are also um uh yeah, let's say breakthrough uh, around standardization of uh, of um, uh, communication uh, and also around performance so the, the cheap uh, the sensors are cheaper uh, the communication means are, are also cheaper and more available the next step to that is 5G, which is going to be a complete uh, game changer also in this uh, in this area. On the other side of the spectrum, you have uh, uh, analytics, which is often now powered by artificial intelligence. And this is where you gain the value of your data. Uh, and this is very important in the perspective of, of uh, sustainability, because th this is going to steer actually your, your, your flow. On that, depending on the way you're going to uh, build your algorithm, you're going to generate a certain amount of, of CO2. And currently, the algorithms are mostly looking at uh, optimizing costs, optimizing uh, lead times, optimizing uh, service levels, optimizing risk potentially, but very rarely uh, optimizing the, the amount of CO2. And this is probably the next uh, step uh, <coughs> in terms of uh, well, how this technology could be, could be reshuffled. Uh, to uh, have uh, algorithm on uh, analytic system who will uh, integrate actually CO2 emission in the equation. And I think that will uh, probably happen when there will be a, a, a real dollar price to a ton of CO2, uh, which might come at some point. And then uh, we, we will really be able to integrate. So right now you can do it with costs that you can get on the market around, around the ton of CO2. But when when uh, company will have to really pay uh, for, for that. Uh, obviously, they are going to change also the way they optimize their, their flow. And actually, what is also not the, the big enabler or the big uh, change maker in, in technology is the, the whole cloud technology. Um, so it's a major enabler for different reasons. One, because uh, it allows to make more data available. So you have more data sources that you can inst integrate, which are not only uh, internal data sources from the, this very large amount of data that actually you could not previously manage on your, your own infrastructure, or you would need actually supercomputer that very few company had. But right now, it provides a, a storage capability and it allows to bring availability of data 
of amount of data that you could not have before. On the second one is the computational um, capacity, which is where actually you can also run analytics that are uh, that brings much higher performance uh, on, on this uh, much larger data set. So a lot of companies are now moving uh, towards, towards cloud. Uh, for this reason, but also for cost reason, because it's also cheaper, uh, you know, like mutualizing the, the infrastructure with other companies. Uh, there are also risk elements. Uh, there are also um, cost structure elements because you basically remove your capex and have much more opex. So financially, it's also interesting for you. And that's why actually right now, even in the COVID situation where most uh, CIO are looking to reduce uh, their costs, uh, cloud is, is almost untouched, and there are still forecasts of uh, double-digit growth in, uh, in in cloud uh, in the in the coming years, uh, despite uh, some, uh, some some savings expected by, by CIO uh, overall the IT budget. Um, so right now the game is actually to integrate these three elements, uh, which actually come from different uh, players, you know, from the cloud players themselves. So if you look at uh, AWS or Azure, they, they have uh, obviously AI components, they have IoT components that they can also integrate in their platforms. And it also comes from application vendors like Oracle or Anaplan, who actually now uh, run their application fully on the cloud, or manage actually instead of having uh, data silos that are sort of unmanageable, uh, they put everything on the cloud and from there they have, uh, after hopefully a bit of time, so some cleaner data sets where they can run uh, relatively clean um, optimization. Uh, there are other technologies that are less in the core, uh, for instance, um, augmented reality uh, is, can be uh, interesting, for instance, in, in warehousing. Uh, there are things like drones that are also more and more used. Uh, blockchain is also there. Uh, but I would say the core on where right now companies are significantly investing are, are these, three, these three areas, primarily powered by cloud. So it, it's massive investments. Uh, and it's also a race, a competitive race, because companies that will achieve that quicker will, will I think, gain a, a very strong competitive advantage in terms of the way they can uh, operate their business uh, more effectively. So in terms of, of sustainability, um, yeah, the, of course, all this amount of data is also creating emissions. Uh, it's not huge compared to other factors, other, other areas like, uh, you know, energy or, or transportation, but still it's creating emissions. Uh, this being said, uh, the, I think the, the gain you get from the optimization, which I explained, so basically this data allows you actually to save in, uh, CO2. So you, <laughs> you create a little bit of emissions from uh, generating, storing this data, but it's basically to help uh, running your business in a way that, that can be more sustainable. But of course, that, that that uh, that requires a change of mindset uh, from uh, from companies uh, to uh, change their objectives into uh, yeah, let's say a, a stakeholder uh, view where they will not only look at, at financial returns but they will look at the the overall uh, impact that they get on the society on the environment. Thank you so much, Luke. That was a very comprehensive overview. Wolfgang, is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of uh, the sustainability challenges that all of this, all of this transition is bringing up? As in, uh, in many parts of life, um, opportunities come with, uh, with challenges and challenges bring opportunities. So I would like to build uh, on what I said before. I think uh, what is the major opportunity and the major challenge at the same time is this connected world. If we get it wrong, we will get it terribly wrong. And in the digital age, everything goes faster. So if we get it right, we can correct things which we have uh, done wrong over many years in a shorter period of time. That's my, my real macro answer. Then when I, when I listen to the conversation, um, I, I remind myself that sustainability can also be defined in different ways. It is, in fact, at, at least a three-dimensional thing. It is economic sustainability, it is environmental sustainability, and it is social sustainability. It's about 
ecological, ethical, and environmental uh, health. And um, then when I think about challenges and opportunities, there is the supranational level, the national level, and the business level. I, I, there's more, but these are big clusters. And when you look at the supranational layer, and we just acknowledge that 50% of trade is attributed to digital, of goods trade is already attributed to digital trade, we need to factor that in. And I'm not sure whether we have factored that, that in. Um, we also have to be mindful of the world we are living. Um, we are living in a world which is driving at high speed towards digitization, uh, which is all about technology and all about standards at the end of the day. And we are creating two universes of standards. One is US centered and the other is China centered. So on the supranational level, if we talk about 4.0, there, there are challenges and there is need for alignment also because data has no passport, no commercial invoice, etc. So when you look at the national level, you also want to look at, at your health, right? At your the people's health. So what is the impact of 4.0 on uh, on health, on uh, people working more from home? Can be good, it can be less good. We have we have to work this out. When I think about the economy, the digital economy, and I hear all, all this and looks at it, and rightly so, it is probably easier to, to fix. But we always think that digital is, is good because it has no emissions, but the digital economy is emitting as much as the aviation industry. And that industry is growing very, very fast. So another area to look at at the national level. And yes, I mentioned this comprehensive uh, policy frame framework. So we have pr probably a risk of uh, losing some on the bandwagon because their systems don't allow to harmonize uh, policies across sectors from logistics to telecommunication, to manufacturing, uh, et cetera, to retail. And you need that because you need this flow so that there are challenges there in the policy framework, especially in, uh, in countries which build them bottom up. Um, these, these are only a few. There is the, the challenge I mentioned before on the SMEs. We, we might create more and more big, big uh, uh, data companies. And we have uh, touched upon that point uh, uh, several times. But I also see a very, very big opportunity. And uh, this is in uh, building the circular economy. So in a much more connected world, if we push the right button, uh, if we optimize our system, if we use the connectiveness uh, or the connectivity uh, to drive innovation in the right way, it can be it can be fantastic and of course capital has to follow wolfgang's conclusion here was really good because there are so many different levels so many different dimensions that we need to keep into account for uh, for painting a picture of reality that is accurate enough for us to make decisions uh, on and uh, we see that top tier impact where we have working groups uh, across all of these different topics where members debate, have calls, like discuss uh, working groups like CO2 emissions, circular economy, green infrastructure, impact metrics, uh, regenerative systems. And when you abstract, because we synthesize this information to see the patterns, you start seeing like very interesting commonalities at times. Uh, and sometimes not. Sometimes you need to connect the dots. So on this note, we will move into our Q&A. There are various questions that have come through from the audience. We will start with um, uh, Anne France, who is asking, can you define sustainability, i.e. how do you comprehend the potential conflicts between the 17 different SDGs? Who would like to take this? So I, I can have a have a go at it. Um, so uh, at, at Amber, we've developed um, an internal framework where we look to separate um, impact um, against the UN SDGs versus 
what what aspects need to be um, need to be managed uh, uh, to ensure that that impact um, doesn't negatively impact on other things. So, say for example, um, our investments in railway, we see them having uh, a big impact on UNSCG. <coughs> Uh, 9 and 11, providing sustainable transport. Um, but if you were look, to look at it in itself, if we were to make investments in rail transport that were all diesel, had a terrible health and safety record, you know, it's not really a sustainable investment. So for us, we try and separate it out into, into the two. So for every, um, every benefit that we're attributing to uh, UNSDGs, we're then looking to balance it with um, what what needs to be uh, managed. So sort of a bit of a balance sheet, I, I suppose. Um, and there are some tools which are, are becoming available to help that sort of SDG balance sheet. Um, but I think they're very good. But the, the, the challenge is with the sort of the, the balance sheet approach to UN Sustainable Development Goals, in my view, is Ultimately, it comes to a bit of an, a, an ethical decision in terms of well, what's more important than the other? Is having impact on uh, climate change more important than impact on um, jobs and, uh, and whatnot? So I think that's challenging. But that's, you know, going to uh, Jason's point, that's what I, I, I find quite positive around the EU taxonomy in that it outlines that, you know, to be a sustainable investment, it also you need to make sure that you're not negatively impacting on a whole suite of other metrics which they've identified. Fantastic. Thanks, Alexandra, Dan. If I may... yeah. Sorry, yeah, Martina, we are actually going to continue this full QA with the various questions that have come up in the sure. QA stage. So at this point, we will wrap up on the stage, we will move there. Thank you guys so much for sharing all of these insights very generously and also in a comprehensive way. This is really appreciated because like we said before, reality is a very complex picture right now and uh, we need to reconcile it on an ongoing way and in a committed way. So thank you for showing up like this and uh, I look forward to continuing in the Q&A area with all the others that will join us there. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and your inspiring, knowledgeable panel. Absolutely fantastic conversation. There can be nothing more important than the conversation we've just heard. I am a techno-utopian, but we've got so much to learn to figure out how we can get the full potential from technology, how technology can impact manufacturing, and how data can power sustainable improvements and behavior change. And now is the time. My truth is that doing good is good business. If success is not sustainable, then it isn't really success. So with that, I'm going to hand you back over to the Q&A and I'll see you back soon. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.